In the greatest blitz on Germany, Allied airmen link up their attacks with Marshal Stalin's armies. British bombers head for Dresden, the Saxony bastion of the Nazis along the Eastern Front. And up comes Goebbels' newest secret weapon, a scarecrow, exploding like a plane hit by Akak. RAF Lancasters splash 650,000 incendiary bombs on transportation lines in Germany's seventh largest city. They smash a big Reich roadblock across the Russian advance. Damage to Dresden, hampering the Wehrmacht, helps Konyev's forces 70 miles away. Out of the West, 1,350 American bombers of the 8th Air Force streak their vapor trails into the dawn. For two full days, Miles of these bombers hammered Reich factory and railroad centers in the east. Chemnitz, Magdeburg, Cottbus. The veteran 1st Division of the 8th Air Force today carried its 200,000 ton of bombs to help an ally. Now they hit Dresden, hardest of all. The Blitz here Blasting away for the Russians now 45 miles away, links the two-front Allied drive from east and west on Berlin. The Seine is in flood. The waters are the highest in 34 years. In this most bitter winter for France, a winter of cold, of hunger, of battered towns, of smashed communications, a winter in which free France lies oppressed by greater hardships than for almost a century, the elements too take their toll. Industrial equipment, barges, cranes, grain elevators in the flat country outside Paris, are flooded, swamped, made useless. Boats are thrown up under what had recently been dry land. Viaducts, vital to the supply lines, must be reinforced. The people of Paris smile wryly and say, not enough food, but plenty of water. Water is the only commodity Paris has in abundance. Water and the spirit to carry on. Alsace welcomes General de Gaulle in celebration of the great triumph at Colmar. As the fighting French of the First Army jab the Wehrmacht back into Germany, at Strasbourg the people gather in their war-torn cathedral. Generals de Tassigny, Juin and Leclerc are here for the victory services. French armor pummeled Nazi fortresses in the Vosges hills, and French soldiers tore Rundstedt's legions to tatters. Hailed by General Eisenhower, they are decorated now by their leader. From now on, heroes of Strasbourg and Colmar will fight on German soil. At Severn, the nation honors its American allies 
fighting shoulder to shoulder with the French. General Alexander Patch of the 7th Army becomes the commander of the Legion of Honor. The Grand Officer Award goes to the commander of the 6th Army Group, General Jacob Devers. Once again, France and America beat back the ruthless hordes from over the Rhine. And once again, fighting Frenchmen march through a free Alsace. Peace had come to Athens under the warm Mediterranean sun. When Mr. Churchill met my son Randolph, visited Greece on the return from the Crimea. Others in the party were Field Marshal Alexander, General Scobie, and the British Ambassador. Archbishop Damaskinus, the Regent of Greece, went with the Prime Minister to the palace in Constitution Square, where a great throng of 60,000 people waited to cheer the visitor. Mr. Churchill congratulated them on the end of the Civil War and wished a speedy return to prosperity to the people of heroic Greece. On the Third Army Front in Germany, American soldiers have fought in snow, in ice, in fog, and now along flooded roads, flooded marshes, flooded streams. The snow in the Eiffel and Vosges has melted. Torrents of water came down across the roads, and troops and supplies have a hard time moving up. Sometimes, Americans hold one end of a bridge, Germans the other. The enemy has to be bombed or mortared out before the advance can proceed. Then a footbridge is built, and the men go over, often under heavy fire from farther up the opposite bank. Over and over, the bridges are hit and smashed. So a smoke screen is laid down to cover the operation, and damp, rainy weather keeps the oil fog close to the ground. When the wind shifts, the canisters are floated downstream to the windward. Ammunition, food stores, and medical supplies are carried across. The trucks go over, too, at a second crossing. The troops advance, with the river and smoke screen behind them. Germans, live Germans. Meanwhile, on the northern sector of the front, the Canadian First Army under General Creer attacks east of Nijmegen. Cleve is taken, Gaw is taken. The Rhine is reached at Emmerich. Field Marshal Montgomery, caught in a traffic jam, decides the tanks have priority and stops for a bite to eat. And the tanks go forward. Here begins the new Allied offensive. first two weeks, the Canadians took 10,000 prisoners. They cleared the Reichswald forest, cleared a maze of German junctions, broke through three belts of the Siegfried Line. And war comes into the German homeland as it came to other homelands when the Nazis were riding high. Germany is learning what it means to begin a war.